Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will someone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I uh, have this habit of coming here every year um, after assembly, and uh, we've got the added complexity of um, the quinquennial visitation of Croydon. And so um, Tony's uh, kindly, uh, he's at Mount Evelyn, Miles Fagan's at Croydon. Anyway, uh, good to be with you. Now, uh, this morning, we've got this uh, very important chapter in Romans, Romans chapter five to look at, the first half. Um, and, uh, I guess the aim of my sermon this morning is, uh, that you would be a better boaster. Now that's, that's a bit of a strange one to, to come to. It might be a bit of a surprise because in general, uh, boasting, uh, it's not something you generally, uh, want to have really, is it? Um, generally, uh, we, we hate boasters. We, we try to avoid boasters uh, in our lives. It's usually quite a painful thing to be around them. You know, you, they're usually talking themselves up, you know, constantly telling you how good they are. And as we talk about these types, uh, there may be a few boastful people that come to your mind of people in your life, uh, perhaps people you work alongside, you know, those people who are always saying, I can do that. I can do that. I, uh, I can do that better than most people. Uh, I've got the most experience or um, I, I'm far stronger than that other person or, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've got the capacity to, to get that project done. Uh, maybe it's a Facebook connection or some kind of social media. Uh, there's often those people who are regularly sharing some news with you about how wonderful they've been at a certain thing. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, look, at, look at my wonderful child and what they've achieved. Uh, maybe it's um, some new expensive car that they've got or, or some holiday that they've been on. Look at, look at how wonderful my life is. Boasters aren't very pleasant people to be around. And most of the time we find that they're, they're just full of hot air. They're just full of hot air in the end. They've overstated their case. And uh, they've exaggerated their achievements. And when everything comes out in the wash, as it so often does, then they, they are left uh, with, uh, I guess, uh, far less impressive than what they made out. They're left <laughs> embarrassed. It usually doesn't go well for the boaster. And yet here in Romans 5, and I hope you have it open in front of you there, here in P Romans 5, Paul clearly encourages us to boast. Uh, look at what Paul says in verse 2. Uh, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, down at the end of the passage, verse 11, he says, not only so is this, uh, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are no two ways about it. We Christians are to be boasters. So what's, what exactly is the apostle 
asking of us. Is he saying that we as Christians are, are to, to turn into some kind of selfish, unpleasant, unsociable people? No, not at all. In fact, it's an entirely different kind of boasting uh, that Paul is talking about here. You see, the context shows us that he is talking about a strong confidence in something that we possess as Christians, something that's incredibly valuable, something that we really ought to take pride in. Now, for, the, for that unpleasant boaster that we might know, what is the object of their boasting? Well, it's themselves, isn't it? It's, it's their achievements, their children, their wisdom, their wealth. This is what I have done. Look how awesome I am. The object of their boasting comes back to themselves. But that's clearly not the kind of boasting that Paul wants Christians to do. Far from it. And in the opening chapters of Romans, Paul has, has focused on how, how uh, misplaced any confidence in ourselves is. All people are moral, moral failures. And so uh, the start of Romans talks about how the, the Gentiles, they suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then the Jews, well, the Jews are no better. Uh, sure, they have the law, but they are hypocrites because they don't follow the law. And in uh, Romans 3 verse 19, Paul puts it very simply. He says, every mouth falls silent. The whole world is accountable and no one, no one is declared righteous. So Christians that have this realistic understanding of themselves, there is nothing that we can boast about. But here in chapter 5, Paul's talking about a completely different type of boasting, if you like. A boasting not in ourselves, but this boasting is focused on God. And so you see that in verse 11. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what Paul calls us to do as believers is to have our focus on God and to see him and see what he's done as, as that thing that is infinitely valuable and supremely praiseworthy. As Christians, we ought to be people who boast not in ourselves but in God, boast in what he has done. Perhaps a better word for it is, is confidence. We are confident because that's what, what Paul wants us to have. That's what he, he wants us to go out from this place today with a confidence that transforms who we are and, and, and the way we think and, and the way we behave. So let's take a look at where, where Paul encourages us to find our confidence. Uh, so firstly, he encourages us to see that we can have confidence in knowing God. Confidence in knowing God. Uh, look with me, verse 1 again. He begins, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing we need to understand is that uh, this section and all that follows builds on what Paul has been saying so far. He's just spent the first four chapters of Romans explaining that it's only through Jesus that you and I can be justified. And now he says, therefore, 5.1, five, five, since we have been justified through faith. And this word justified, it, it comes from the law courts. It means to be declared not guilty, to stand in this right relationship, to no longer be in the dock, but effectively to be a, a free person. Paul's clearly argued this can never happen by the things that we do, and yet it happens wonderfully through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his death, through his resurrection, only because of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, is it possible for human beings to stand before God and be declared not guilty? We have been justified through faith. 
And because of this, Paul says, we have peace with God. What Paul's talking about isn't just some subjective truth. Uh, You know, that kind of feeling of peace with God, that feeling of peacefulness, of everything being right in the world. And and, uh, certainly that's a great thing for Christians to have. Uh, Hopefully we can have that as uh, followers of the Lord Jesus. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's actually talking about an objective reality. Uh, Verse 10 talks about us as being God's enemies. And, uh, and, and throughout the first four chapters, Paul's been very careful to show that as humans, we've set ourselves up against God, do our own thing, rebel against him, we turn our backs on him. Therefore, we are in opposition to him. We're opposed to him, opposed to his rule. We're enemies with God. Therefore, God is enemies with us. And therefore, we are at war with God. But, says Paul, through Christ, those who trust in him have now moved from being at war to being at peace. In a month's time, we're going to be celebrating Armistice Day, or or perhaps better known, uh, Remembrance Day, Uh, the 11th hour, the 11th day, 11th month, uh, which marks the end of hostilities in the Western Front back in Uh, 1918. And it was on that day in that particular area where conflict ceased and, and, uh, and that place moved from being at war to being at peace. What Paul's saying is this, that, that Christians remember Good Friday and Easter Sunday as, as that point in which our hostility with God ended. Peace was declared, not by us, but by God himself. We are, we are at peace with God. No longer enemies, now we're friends. And you see that, that Paul says, not only do we have peace with God, he says we've got access, access to God. That's verse 2. Through whom we have gained access by faith. And that word access carries with it this sense of being invited into the presence of a person of great power, great great prestige, entering the presence of royalty, if you like, but being brought into the presence by somebody somebody else. So imagine, imagine that uh, you want to go and see the new king, King Charles. So what do you do? You catch a, a plane over to England, uh, you doll yourself up, you put on your best clothing, you, you comb your hair, and you make your way to Buckingham, Buckingham Palace, and then you go and you knock on the door, and he opens the door, and there you go. You can see the king, right? No, that's, that's not how it works. You can't do that because you can't get near the door. Uh, before you get to the door, there's these great big gates. Uh, they stop you from getting anywhere near. I've got a slide of that. There we go. You, they, get, they stop you from getting anywhere near. And if they don't stop you, well, there's some very serious men with very serious weaponry, and they'll have a very serious conversation with you um, if you try and get there. So it doesn't matter how much you desire to, to uh, get to him, to have access to the new king, you can't do it. But imagine, imagine you knew someone in the royal family. Just imagine that. Imagine that they give you this royal invitation and, and have given your name to the gatekeepers at Buckingham Palace. Imagine that they, they meet you at the gate and they usher you in, they escort you into the palace itself and into the very presence of the king. Well, then you could have confidence, couldn't you? Because you, you know someone in the family. You've You've been invited in and brought into his presence. And that is what the Lord Jesus has done for, for us. We, we have peace with God and access to God through him. We've been brought into the presence of the king. But Paul's saying something even more profound here, I think, in, in verse 2. He says, 
through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Now, you'd expect him to say we have access to God. And that's certainly what he means, but he says that we've gained access into this grace in which we now stand because this is the basis of our confidence. Not because of me, not because of you, not, not because of anything that we have done, but because of what he has done. So we can have confidence that we know God and be at peace with God. We no longer be enemies but friends. It's all because of God's grace. So Paul says we have access to this grace in which we now stand. As Christian believers, to live as a Christian is to stand in grace. It's to stand firmly in the midst of all the benefits, the death, Son of God for us. Not my own merits, not my own abilities, all on what he has done. This kind gesture, it is grace. That is the place we need to come to in order to have this peace with God. It is grace where you need to remain. Now, it's, it's very easy for us, I think, uh, to live the Christian life and think that it's, it's about accepting uh, what God has done for us, which it is, of coming and accepting his <coughs> grace, which it is, but then somehow leaving grace behind wandering away from grace, focusing perhaps on our own efforts, our good works, our, our religious ceremonies, our attendance at church perhaps. But Paul will have none of that. No, we take our stand in grace. Then, now, in the future, we stand on grace. We never leave it. Now, I don't know where you are in the Christian journey, uh, whether you're just starting out as a Christian or perhaps you're a, you're a veteran. You've been a Christian for many, many years. Wherever you are, don't ever move from grace. Well, that's the first confidence that Paul gives us, confidence in knowing God. Uh, the second is rather surprising. Uh, Paul says we can have confidence in our suffering. We can have confidence in our suffering. So Paul anticipates, I think, the question that, that might come to our mind when we're thinking about these wonderful truths, the kind of things that we begin to say to ourselves. You know, well, well, that's all very well and good, but I don't feel, I don't feel peace with God. In fact, life for me is really hard at the moment. And God seems really distant. So, so how can I have peace when life is so painful? Well, Paul gives us an answer, but his answer uh, might come as a bit of a shock. And so there in verse 3, he says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Very surprising. And, and, and this word for suffering, really it's talking about all those struggles sorrows that we experience in this fallen and dark world. Literally means pressure. Uh, many here today will, will know that feeling of pressure, of that pain that, that life contains at times. And Paul says even in the midst of all that, we can rejoice. Now, if anyone else was to say that, we might think, oh, they're just being trite. You know, uh, they, they, they're saying, oh, cheer up, it's not that bad. They're just trying to stop us uh, being all emotional around them perhaps. But, of course, Paul knew what it means to suffer, suffer for his faith, suffer in life. He knew that pressure. And yet he could say we can rejoice in our sufferings. What does he mean? Well, he's certainly not suggesting that we see pain as somehow uh, pleasant or enjoyable. No, cancer is not enjoyable. Divorce is not enjoyable. Persecution is not enjoyable. Loneliness, 
is not enjoyable. Now, there's no escaping the fact pain is painful. No, we don't try to find pleasure in pain, but rather what we do find is uh, purpose in it. We find purpose in it. We can see that God can take all the difficulties and distresses in our lives and he can make them uh, productive, that our suffering can produce something and produce something that's good. And what Paul does is he, he tells us that this, uh, what this produces in us in verses 3 and 4. In verses 3 and 4, it, it's building our perseverance, which builds our character, which builds our hope. And here is the productiveness of our suffering. We are confident, even in the midst of all the difficulty, all the pain, God is producing something good. He is maturing and strengthening our faith. We really ought to have confidence in our suffering. And then thirdly, he goes on, thirdly, we, we also have confidence in our love. Confidence in God's love, that is. Once again, Paul anticipates another question that might come to our minds as we think about this. What if we're hoping in the wrong place? What if we put our hope in the wrong things? What if God was to let us down when it counts? Well, Paul answers these questions, I think, in verse, verse 5 there. He says, this hope does not disappoint us. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. We can never be ashamed to put our hope in Christ because we can have this complete confidence in this. God loves us. Paul wants us to have this absolute rock-solid confidence in the love of God for us, and he tells us to have that confidence in two particular ways. You see, the first one is through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's in verse 5. Uh, again, ver God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. In one sense, this is uh, part of what the Holy Spirit's role in the life of a Christian is all about. It's to give us assurance, assurance of God's love for us and our identity as his children. And Paul puts it this way in, in chapter 8 of uh, Romans, verse 16. He, he says, the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. But even beyond the work of the spirit, the very presence of the spirit in the believer's life is itself confirmation that God loves us. So just think for a moment of a time when you've had a relationship breakdown with somebody and you try and reconcile and, and work through your differences and perhaps after this process they eventually say to you, yeah, things, things are good with us now. Uh, but still, still they, they avoid eye contact with you. Still they keep their distance from you. Well, as time goes on, you start to realise the writing on the wall that things are still wrong. There's a relationship there that's still broken. But if that person seeks you out, if that person wants to spend time with you, if that person enjoys your company and wants to be with you, well, you know that the relationship really is restored, that the relationship now is healthy again. So how do we know God loves us? Well, he comes to live with us. He seeks us out. Uh, we're told in the Bible that the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to every Christian believer, and that is the, the gift of God himself coming to set up home in our hearts and in our lives. So we can have confidence that God loves us because of his spirit. And secondly, we can also have confidence that God loves us because of the truth of the cross. And sadly, we don't have time to, to, to talk through uh, these amazing verses, verses 6, 7, and 8. But the basic point 
to make is we know that God loves us because of the cross. That's the message. And it's summed up there in verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's in the cross that God demonstrates his love for us. It's a word that conveys this sense of, of proving something to be true, of laying out the evidence before us. God has proved his love for us. He has laid it out publicly, this, this evidence that he loves you and me by dying on the cross. When we look at the cross, we have this rock-solid confidence. What love? I was a sinner. I was a rebel against God and his purposes. I was God's enemy. I was not righteous. I was not good. I was not able to repair things by myself. I was powerless. And yet despite all of that, he died for me. Christ went to the cross willingly, deliberately, and painfully. And he died for me. He died for you. Why would he do that? For any other reason. Only that. He loves you. If you've ever been tempted to doubt the love of God for you, and we all do from time to time, right? Then come back to the cross. How do I know that God loves me? I know it because of the cross. I know because of the historical reality that 2,000 years ago, the man who is God was nailed to the tree. He did it for me. He did it for you. Well, let's turn to the, the final verses of this passage to see our fourth confidence. That is a confidence in our future security. And do you notice in our passage, Paul's talking, taking us through uh, three tenses of the Christian life. Uh, we've seen what God has done for us in the past, that uh, we've been justified, Christ has died for us, and we've seen that what is true in the present as well. We have peace with God. We have access to the grace in which we now stand. And now in these final verses, Paul turns to the future and he says that we will be saved. He wants us to see that if, if we have confidence now, we can have confidence also in the future. We can be confident about a day when Jesus returns to judge the earth. Uh, there's so much about that day that we don't know, like when, when exactly it's going to come. But Paul wants to encourage us that we can look forward to that day with absolute confidence. And the reason is this, because if we have confidence now, we can be certain, certain that we can be confident then, that if Christ died for us while we were still sinners, enemies of God, how much more confident can we be uh, now that we've been made friends with God? If God has saved us at the cross, God will continue to be faithful to us throughout eternity. Uh, now, let me try and explain, uh, illustrate this. Imagine you are desperately poor and you are blaming all of your financial woes on a wealthy landowner. And uh, you're, you're banging on his door and uh, you're yelling at him and you're banging for his blood. But then he opens his door to you and he welcomes you into his house. And he sits you down at his dining room table and he feeds you and he cleans you up and he even uh, gives you a bedroom in his house. He invites you to live with him in his home. And while you're living with him, suppose that you need to catch a train ride across town. You've got no money. And you realise the only thing you need to do, the only thing to do is to go and speak to him and ask this man, this rich man, for help. Now, do you think this man who's already been so kind to you, do you think he'll be good to give you $5 for the train? Well, of course he will. 
Of course, he will give you everything that you need. He has already demonstrated so clearly his love for you. It's been so explicit. Now you are family. Of course, he's going to help you with that train ticket. Now, I don't want to trivialize things too much, but in essence, that's what Paul is saying here in these verses. He's saying if God can do the hardest thing of coming to earth as a human, of dying on the cross in our place, taking the penalty that we deserve, forgiving our sins, winning us reconciliation, bringing us uh, peace with God, making us his very own children, if he can do that, then why wouldn't he be able to follow up with these future blessings that he's promised? If he is faithful in that, he will be faithful right to the very end. We can have absolute confidence. If he's done what he has done at the cross, we'll surely see it through to that final day. So then we boast. That is to say, we express the highest confidence and greatest value, not in ourselves, not even in what we've achieved or what we can do. We express that confidence in what he has done, of who he is, and we rejoice in that. And it shapes all that we are. You see, Paul wants us to go away with that confidence in our hearts and that same confidence on our lips that we speak about it to ourselves, firstly, to each other, and confidence to tell it to all those that we know. And do you know Christians who are like that, with that confidence? You know, they love God. They know God loves them. They have that confidence. It's so obvious that it's deep in their heart. It's shining out of them. We, we have a different kind of boasting. It's a, it's a confidence not in ourselves but in God. So let's rejoice and let's, let's be confident. Let's exult. Let's boast in our relationship with God and all that flows from that relationship. Let me lead us in prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Thank you that you continue to love us. We thank you that we may be confident in that because you have given us your spirit and you have come to us to die on the cross for us. Please fill us with that confidence in you and in your grace and may it overflow in all that we do and think and say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.